The Merchant of Venice by William Shakespeare. Hi friends, this is me Payal Datta and in today's video I am going to help you with the line by line explanation of Act 1, Scene 2 from William Shakespeare's play The Merchant of Venice. Please hit the like button if you like my video and don't forget to subscribe. Links to other scenes are given in the description below. So, here we begin. Act 1, Scene 2, Belmont, a room in Portia's house. Enter Portia and Nerissa. The scene opens with Portia, the heiress of Belmont, and Nerissa, her lady-in-waiting. From the hearty masculine world of Venice that we find in Act 1, Scene 1, we move to the feminine piece of Belmont. Portia by my troth, Nerissa, my little body is aweary of this great world. Here, Portia tells Nerissa that her poor little body was aweary, that is, tired of the great world. Like Antonio in the first scene, Portia complains to her trusted friend, Nerissa, about being sad. Nerissa, like Salerio, first offers a materialistic explanation. That is, according to her, Portia is depressed for having too much money and possession. She says, You would be sweet, madam, if your miseries were in the same abundance as your good fortunes are. Your Nerissa means to say that Portia would be tired only if she had bad luck instead of wealth and good luck. Your good fortunes refer to all the wealth Portia had inherited. And yet for aught I see, they are as sick that surfeit with too much as they that starve with nothing. Your Nerissa goes on to say that people with excess suffer as much as people who starve with nothing. It is no mean happiness, therefore, to be seated in the mean. She says that the best way to be happy is to be in between. Nerissa plays with the word mean. No mean happiness. Your mean means little. Whereas when she states to be seated in the mean, Mean means between. Superfluity comes sooner by white hairs, but competency lives longer. That is, those who have too much grow old quickly, but those who have just enough live longer. Portia Good sentences and well pronounced. Nerissa They would be better if well followed. So when Portia agrees to Nerissa, stating that she had a good point, Nerissa tells Portia that it would be better if Portia applied them to her life. Portia If to do were as easy as to know what were good to do, chapels had been churches and poor men's cottages, princes' palaces. It is a good divine that follows his own instructions. I can easier teach twenty what were good to be done than be one of the twenty to follow my own teaching. So Portia tells Nerissa that if doing good deeds were as easy as knowing how to do them, then everybody would be better off. Small chapels would be big churches and poor men's cottages would be princes' palaces. It takes a good divine, that is, a good preacher, to practice what he preaches. Portia confesses that it would be easier for her to teach 20 people than be the one person out of 20 who actually do good things. The brain may devise laws for the blood, but a hot temper leaps o'er a cold decree. Your Portia makes a distinction between reason and will, or mind and body. She says that the brain can tell the heart what to do. But the cold rules don't matter when one has a hot temper. Such a hair is madness to skip over the meshes of good counsel. Portia compares youthful high spirit to a hair which easily leaps over the meshes, that is, the nets of good advice. Young people are like rabbits and good advice is like an old man trying to catch them. But this reasoning is not in the fashion to choose me a husband. 
O oh, me, the word choose. I may neither choose who I would, nor refuse who I dislike. So is the will of a living daughter curbed by the will of a dead father. Is it not hard, Nerissa, that I cannot choose one nor refuse none? She goes on to say that she can neither choose the one she likes nor refuse the one she dislikes because the choice of a husband depends on the lottery of cascades devised according to her late father's will. To this, Nerissa replies, your father was ever virtuous and holy men at their death have good inspirations therefore the lottery that he hath devised in these three chests of gold silver and lead whereof who chooses his meaning chooses you will no doubt never be chosen by any rightly but one who you shall rightly love Portia's father specified in his will that she couldn't choose her husband. Instead, when he died, he left behind a riddle. Anyone who wants to marry Portia must choose one of the three caskets, each marked with a clue. One is made of gold, one of silver, and the other of lead. The one who chooses the right casket takes Portia as his bride. Portia appears to be anxious over the prospects of choosing her husband through the lottery. However, from Nerissa's reply, we can say that Nerissa's reaction to the lottery was positive. She calls Portia's father ever virtuous and pious, asserting that holy men had inspirations at the time of his death. She consoles Portia by saying that she will be chosen correctly by the person whom she shall rightly love. Never be chosen by any rightly but one who you shall rightly love. Here Nerissa puns on the word rightly. First she means to say that no one would ever choose the right box who does not deserve Portia. She also means to tell Portia that the right person would choose her who would love her truly. But what warmth is there in your affection towards any of these princely suitors that are already come? Now the two young women go on to amuse themselves by gossiping about the suitors who have already assembled at Belmont. Portia, I pray thee, overname them, and as thou namest them, I will describe them, and according to my description, level my affection. Portia asked Nerissa to call out their names, and she would describe them. Accordingly, she wants Nerissa to guess her affection towards them. Nerissa, first there is the Neapolitan prince, Portia, eh, that's a colt indeed, for he doth nothing but talk of his horse, and he makes it a great appropriation to his own good parts that he can shew him himself. I am much afeard my lady his mother played false with a smith. Your Portia describes the Neapolitan prince from Naples, that is Italy. She calls him a colt, that is, a young horse. She thinks he is an awkward young man who thought it was a great accomplishment to his character that he could shoe his horse himself, that is, he had a well control over his horse. She also informs Nerissa about her knowledge of his mother's affair with the blacksmith. Nerissa, then is there the country palatine, Portia. He doth nothing but frown, as who should say, and you will not have me choose. He hears merry tales and smiles not. I fear he will prove the weeping philosopher when he grows old, being so full of unmanly sadness in his youth. So, when Nerissa asks Portia about her affection towards country palatine, the cunt from Palatinate, she tells her that he does nothing but frown as if to say if Portia will not marry him, she may choose someone else. He is so sullen and gloomy that even funny merry tales don't make him smile. I fear he will prove the weeping philosopher when he grows old, being so full of unmannerly sadness in his youth. Portia feels that he will become a sad philosopher when he grows old. 
Portia here alludes to Heraclitus when she calls him a weeping philosopher. Heraclitus was a Greek philosopher who lamented the stupidity of mankind and wept for everything in the world. He went to live alone in the mountains because he was so distressed of mankind. I had rather married to a dead head with a bone in his mouth than to either of these. God defend me from the two. So Portia says that she would rather marry a dead skull than country palatine or the Neapolitan prince. Nerissa, how say you by the French lord Moisier Libon, Portia? God made him and therefore let him pass for man. In truth, I know it is a sin to be mocked, but he, why, he had a horse better than the Neapolitans, a better bad habit of frowning than the Count Palatine. He is every man in no man. When Nerissa asks Portia about the French lord, Portia says that he was more attached to his horse than the Neapolitan prince and excelled in frowning than Count Palatine. She says he is every man in no man, meaning he has everybody else's characteristics and no personality of his own. She goes on to describe him, saying, A throstle sing, he falls straight a capering. He will fence with his shadow. If I should marry him, I should marry twenty husbands. If he would despise me, I would forgive him. For if he love me to madness, I shall never requite him. Your Portia dis describes the French lord. She tells Nerissa that the French lord was so fickle minded that he would jump about when he heard a bird singing. Further, if he did not have anybody to fight with, he would take his own shadow as his rival. Portia feels that marrying him is like marrying 20 men all rolled into one. She concludes describing her affection for him, stating that she would understand if he hated him, because if he loved him desperately to madness, she could never be able to love him back. Nerissa What say you then to Falconbridge, the young baron of England? Portia You know I say nothing to him, for he understands me not, nor I him. He hath neither Latin, French, nor Italian. And you will come into the court and swear that I have a poor penny worth in English? He is a proper man's picture. But alas, who can converse with a dumb show? How oddly he is suited. I think he brought his doublet in Italy, his round horse in France, his bonnet in Germany, and his behavior everywhere. So, when Nerissa asks Portia about Falconbridge, the young baron of England, Portia's reply, we learn about the Elizabethan Englishmen's thoughts of their continental neighbours. The young baron is a caricature of the Englishmen abroad. The English have never been good at speaking foreign languages, nor is there a national dress for England like other countries. They seem to imitate the costumes of other countries. Here Portia says that she had no opinion about Falconbridge because they didn't understand each other. He did not understand French, Latin or Italian and Portia knew very little English. She calls him a proper man, that is, a handsome man, but calls their conversation a dumb show. Dumb shows were plays where characters did not speak and conveyed their messages by gestures. Portia further mocks his old dressing style. She says that she thinks he got his jacket in Italy, his tights from France and his hat from Germany and his behavior everywhere. Yet doublet refers to his jacket, bonnet refers to his hat and round horse to his tights. Nerissa, what think you of the Scottish lord, his neighbor, Portia, that he hath a neighborly charity in him, for he borrowed a box of the year of the Englishman and swore he would pay him again when he was able. 
I think the Frenchman became his surety and sealed under for another. Your Nerissa asks Portia about the Scottish Lord. Your his neighbour means neighbour to the Englishman Falconbridge. Portia says that she thinks that the Scottish Lord was very forgiving because he let the Englishman blow his ear without hitting him back. Rather than defending himself, he would threaten to pay back the Englishman later. I think the Frenchman became his surety and sealed under for another. Your Portia means to say that she thinks the French Lord promised to help the Scottish Lord by paying back to the Englishman and sign his name underneath the Scotsman's signature on the imaginary bond. Nerissa, how like you the young German, the Duke of Saxony's nephew? Portia, very wildly in the morning when he is sober and most wildly in the afternoon when he is drunk. When he is best, he is little worse than a man, and when he is worst, he is little better than a beast. And the worst fall that ever fell, I hope I shall make shift to go without him. When Nerissa asks Portia about the young German, she says that he was less than a man in behavior. When she was sober in the morning, and when he was drunk in the afternoon, he was no better than a beast. Portia's speeches show that she is witty and self-possessed, but at the time, she is also very cruel and prejudiced. Dismissing her German suitor as a beast, she makes the first animal insult in the play. She says that if the worst happened, that is, she got married to the German, then she could find a way to go on without him. On hearing this, Nerissa immediately replies, If he should offer to choose and choose the right casket, you should refuse to perform your father's will, if you should refuse to accept him. She says that if the German lord chooses to try his luck to win Portia, and he chooses the right casket and Portia rejects him, then she would disobey her father's will. To this Portia says, Therefore, for fear of the worst, I pray thee, set a deep glass of Rhenish wine on the contrary casket. For if the devil be within and the temptation without, I know he will choose it. I will do anything, Nerissa, ere I will be married to a sponge. To prevent the young German from choosing the right casket, Portia instructs Nerissa to place a tall glass of Rhenish wine on the wrong casket. Portia was sure that the German suitor would not be able to resist his temptation of his national drink. I will do anything, Nerissa, ere I will be married to a sponge. Portia calls the young German a sponge because like a sponge that constantly absorbed water, the drunk young German constantly absorbed liquor. After Portia's view about the suitors, Nerissa tells Portia, You need not fear, lady, the having of these lords. They have acquainted me with their determinations, which is indeed to return to their homes and to trouble you no more with suit, unless you may be won by some other sort than your father's imposition, depending on the caskets. Nerissa comforts Portia, saying that she does not have to worry about any of these suitors because they had acquainted, that is, informed her with their decision to go back home and give up on their attempts unless there was some other way to win her other than the lottery of caskets. On hearing this, Portia replies, If I live to be as old as Sibylla, I will die as chaste as Diana. Unless I be obtained by the manner of my father's will, I am glad this parcel of words are so reasonable, for there is not one among them, but I dote on his very absence, and I pray God grant them a fair departure. Portia alludes to Sibyl and Diana. Sibyl from Ovid's Metamorphosis was granted by Apollo many years of life as the number of grains she held in her hands. Diana was the goddess of virginity. Portia, who was initially anxious over the prospects of choosing her husband, would remain like a virgin, Diana, even if she lives as old as Sibyl. 
unless she is won in marriage by some suitor in the lottery of caskets. With a sign of relief, she states that she was glad with the suitor's decision who was sensible enough to stay away. The only thing she liked about them was their decision not to try their luck. She wishes them all a safe departure home. Nerissa then reminds Portia of the Venetian scholar and soldier who visited Belmont to accompany the Marquis of Montferrat. Nerissa, do you not remember lady in your father's time, a Venetian, a scholar and a soldier that came hither in company of the Marquis of Montferrat? Portia, yes, yes, it was Bassanio, as I think so he was called. Portia, recalling the name of Bassanio, proves that she loved him already. Nerissa, true madam, he of all the men that ever my foolish eyes looked upon was the best deserving a fair lady. In this scene, Portia feels for Bassanio very positively. She tells Nerissa that he fully deserves her praise. I remember him well and I remember him him worthy of thy praise. Portia's simple reply to Nerissa when she calls Bassanio the best deserving lady shows that she is already in love with Bassanio. How now what news enters a servant? The conversation of the two ladies are interrupted as a servant arrives. Servant, the four strangers seek for you, madam, to take their leave, and there is a form forerunner coming from the fifth the prince of morocco who brings word the prince his master will be here tonight the servant informs portia that the suitors who have decided to give up on their luck were ready to leave and that a messenger had come already ahead of his master the prince of morocco bringing words that his master would arrive that night Shakespeare here seems to have forgotten that he had already mentioned six suitors before and calls them four strangers. He wrongly refers to the Prince of Morocco as the fifth suitor. The scene concludes with Portia's speech. Portia, if I could bid the fifth welcome with so good heart as I can bid the other four farewell, I should be glad of his approach if he have the condition of a saint and the complexion of a devil, I had rather he should shrive me than wife me. Portia says that if she could welcome Morocco as happily as she would say goodbye to the departing suitors, she would be glad at his arrival. If Morocco was as good as a saint but black as a devil, Portia would rather make him hear her confessions than allow him to marry her. Your Portia's demonstrations about her outlook of marriage can be seen. Come, Nerissa, Sirrah, go before. Whilst we shut the gate upon one wooer, another knocks at the door. Portia asks Nerissa to accompany her and asks the servant to go ahead. She sighs that as soon as they shut the door on one suitor, another one knocks at the door. The, this is how they leave the scene. So this is the end of Act 1, Scene 2. Please like and share your views in the comment section. And if you have any doubt, leave it in the comment section. I will definitely reply. And please don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And if you need the explanation of any other scene, check.